It's very orange in here. It's afternoon in Florida. <laughs> I can't I can't adjust the orangeness right now. Um, we are on Dandy's chapter and she is riding with Kal and the Kalasar and Drogo is non-responsive. He is kind of slumped in his horse seat. Um, the blood flies, they call them blood flies, they eat from people and horses, you know, how flies just fly around. Um, they are beginning to land on him and he's not even like responding to them. Danny sees this and of course she's worried. She calls um, she calls him Call and she calls him Drogo and she says my son and stars like softly to him kind of trying not to call attention to what's going on and he doesn't answer and she touches him and he falls off his horse and as we know a man without his horse in the Kalasar is nothing and for a call to draw a call and for a call to fall off of his horse that's bad. So she rushes over to him and Hago is like he fell off his horse. So she tells them to, you know, don't tell anybody to stop the Kalasar and say they're going to camp there for the night. But they're like in a desert. There's nothing around for them to eat or drink or anything. And they're like, we can't camp here. She's like, we have to. Uh, one of the other blood riders says, you know, you're Khaleesi. You don't tell me what to do, which I find is interesting. Like that's the Kal's wife, but she can't command anything. That's, I think I just find that interesting. Um, she's like, listen, stop the Kalasar, tell him it's because, you know, I can't ride anymore because of my pregnancy and go find my my witch doctor lady um, so she can come help. They aren't happy about this. Call fell off his horse, but they do what they're told. So Danny is there with her handmaids um, waiting for the witch lady to come. Jorah tells her to send the maids away. He's like, listen, we have to get away from here. Tonight, we need to leave and we need to go to Eshai because he knows once Call dies, Danny has to go to uh, Via Stothrock. Like, it's over for her. And we know she won't do well there. He's like, um, these people are going to kill you and probably your baby. Your baby has been prophesized to mount the world and... If you stay here, they can't have a threat like that around. They're going to kill you and the baby. So we need to get out of here. She says his blood riders wouldn't allow that to happen. And he's like, they follow their call into death. They're going to take you to Via Stealth Rock. And then they're going to follow him. So you, ha you will have no protection once this is over. So the witch lady comes in. The blood rider is like, this is all your fault. And he's kind of not listening to her. She's in a state of panic right now. Um, he goes to leave. Jorah says... You know, that one right there, he's he's dangerous because he knows he has to follow the call in death and a dead man fear has no fear. The witch asks about the bandage that she put on his chest. Um, they said he took it away because it itched. The, the witch lady says, yeah, it, 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 there's magic in the fire. Like, it was supposed to itch and burn. I told you that. Someone mentioned that they thought that, because um, I said, obviously, the witch lady, you know, she had malice in, like in her intent when she cleaned up the call and someone said that he just thought it was from Call's own um like arrogance that he was just gonna do what he wanted to anyway I can definitely see that like it, it could be both ways but it probably could just be the call was just arrogant in it um again I've seen this show so that kind of alters the way you look at things when you read the book which is why it's better to read the book first Danny says save him and I'll give you anything you want. She's pretty much just pleading with her and the the and the witch lady says uh bring me his horse. There's a spell I can do, but once I start, you cannot enter this tent. Death will be in here. Like you can't come in here once I start. Are you sure you want to do this? And Danny's like I have to save him. Jorah comes back there. He's wearing his chainmail like he's ready to fight if he needs to and he sees her and he's like what have you done? She's like He's my husband. He, you know, he's the father of my child. I had to save him. And Jorah's like, we could have been, we could have left. We could have been gone by now, but I don't even know if we can do that now. She's like, am I your princess? And he says, yes. And she says, well, you need to stand with me and save me now. One of the riders comes up and he's trying, he's about to walk into the tent. And Khaleesi says, no, you can't do that. And he's like, I'm going in the tent. And Jorah stands in between them and tries to stop them. The two of them start to fight. 
Jorah kills him, of course, because he has his chainmail on, because he's not stupid. In the middle of this, Danny was thrown to the ground into her belly. She's having pains, and she's pretty, she's beginning to go into birth. Jorah picks her up, because he doesn't really know what else to do, so he goes to take her into the tent, and Danny says, no, we mustn't go in there. Like, the witch lady said, no, we can't go in there. Death is dancing around in there with her. Are you crazy? There are shadows and stuff. And Jorah's like, we, we gotta. So they go into the tent. Okay, we are on to Arya's chapter. I really like this chapter because in, in the show, they really couldn't, they didn't show what Arya had been up to in the time between when she left Sirio Pharrell um, and then what happened, you know, when she saw her dad being beheaded, which is this chapter. But um, we got to see some of how she had been surviving. So Arya is catching pigeons in uh, Flea Bottom because pigeons are easier to catch than cats. Like she has her needle and the pigeons were like gather at the bottom of windowsills like picking up crumbs and she just kind of like jumps after them and slices at them to kill them. Even if she catches a foot they still fall and she and break its neck. So like pigeons are easy to catch so that's how she's been surviving. And she there's some shops that if she goes with her pigeon They'll clean it and even like trade her like half of her pigeon for a bowl of stew um, and then brown up the other part of the pigeon for her. So she's been surviving by trading the pigeons that she's been catching. Been hoping to get out of the city, but of course, all the exits are blocked by the gold cloaks um, and there's really no way out of there. She's been listening to all the gossip of the city and everyone has a different story of what's happened who's died how they died some people say the queen killed robert some people say that the hand killed him some people say no the hand has died and the king is fine and like there's so many stories floating around no one really knows what's happened some people are saying that robert choked on a fishbone like no one really knows what happened so she's been staying in flea bottom um she had all of her possessions with her one night when she was huddled in like this empty burnt out house but people stole her stuff from her. The only reason they hadn't gotten needles because she was laying on it. Like, it's rough. And even just her walking through the streets alone, um, being young and a girl, like she's, like, she's having to, like, be careful of people stealing from her all the time. So she's walking around with her cloak over needles so no one can see it because they would definitely want a sword. She makes her way towards the docks and she sees that her father's ship is still there and... Um, she's standing there looking at it and someone yells at her, what are you doing here, boy? Like, they don't recognize that she's a girl. They're looking for a girl, obviously, because everyone's looking for Arya. But they didn't know who she was, so she she kind of feels safe that she looks like a boy right now. But she has a little bit of hope because the fathership is still there, so she's kind of, I guess, hanging on hope that they'll still be able to leave. So she's running away from the ship and she realizes that she dropped her pigeon and she doesn't know where it is. She was just kind of panicked or whatever. Um, when the bells of the city start to toll. So everyone's gathering in uh, the Sept of Baylor, um, the Hound, everyone's there, and they bring out her father, and she's happy to see him, but she can tell that he's thin and he's not doing well. The cast on his leg is gray and gross, and she can see he's not been taken care of. And then there, standing next to everyone, is Sansa in her blue dress, looking happy. And Arya's like, why the hell is she looking happy when this is happening? Ned's standing there, um, he says his name is Lord Eddard Stark, and he confesses his crimes against Joffrey Baratheon, whatever, the whole spiel, whatever. And he says he's a traitor, and everybody goes crazy and starts throwing things at him. The King's Guard stands in front of Joffrey to protect him from all the shit flying everywhere. The High Septon stands in front of Joffrey and says this man has confessed his sins before the gods. What do you say we do with him? Or what should we tell them? <laughs> what do you say we do with him? What should be done with him? And Joffrey says that Sansa has asked for mercy for him, but as long as he is king, traitors won't go unpunished, and Sir Illyn bring me his head. The crowd goes crazy. Arya is sitting on the statue of Baylor, and she feels it, like, move forward because the crowd is, like, surging forward to watch. Um, she's upset. Arya jumps off the statue. She's grabbing needles. She's going to go up there and try to save her dad. She's making her way through the crowd. She hears someone say, hey, you. And she goes past him. Then the person grabs her. Um, and she's still fighting, trying to make her way up there. She drops a needle, and the person tells her, like, don't look, don't look, and grabs her head so she can't see. And he's saying, like, look at me, boy. Don't you remember me, boy? Like, he's trying to get her attention away from what's going on on the stairs. Um, and she's trying to remember who the heck he is. 
He picks her up and she hears this sound like the whole crowd takes like a big sigh and then they go crazy again and she hears like and that was obviously Ned being beheaded. She finally remembers that it's Yorin and that she had met him before. He had somehow retrieved Needle from the ground in this big crowd or whatever. And he pulls her away from everything that's going on. So he's picking her up. He's taking her to an alley. And she said she's not something. Like, she goes to say something. He's like, you're not a smart boy. Is that what you're saying? I hope you can use that. And she's, he's talking about Needle. And he starts to cut off her hair. And she's crying. Because Ned is dead. It was such a small, like, I like how they did it from Arya's perspective. I kind of wish he had been done from Ned's perspective. That would have been really interesting. But, like, just the way it was just, like, a couple of lines. Like, the, you can hear the collective sigh from, like, the crowd. And you know that he's been beheaded. It was, I like, it was well done. I just wish it had been done from Ned's point of view. Like, silence. Anyway, that's Arya. Next chapter is Bran. He is at Winterfell and he's watching Sir Roderick try to train new people to defend Winterfell because all the good men went off with Ned when he went and then Rob took the rest of them to war. So now they're left trying to train what's left over to defend Winterfell if need be. Bran is wishing that he could go down there and fight with them. He had the idea of Hodor being his legs while he, you know, wielded the sword or whatever, but that, of course, won't work and Sir Maester Pycelle says you know when a knight acts or soldier acts his legs and arms and everything must act as one and that wouldn't work with Hodor being in, the, uh, in a fight with you that would definitely not work. Bran has had a dream that um, he saw Ned Stark down in the crypts in Winterfell and he tried to get Hodor to take him down to the crypts but Hodor wouldn't go past the first few steps. Hodor's like uh no. Bran says he almost gave him, like, Hodor a swat, like Nan does, to make him go down there. And Maester Pesel says, uh, no, it's good you didn't because he's not a mule. You don't beat him to make you do what you want. He's a man. Like, come on. And Maester Pesel wants to know why Bran wanted to go down there anyway. He's like, I told you because I saw my father down there in a dream. And Maester Pesel says, you know, but he's not there now. So what are you doing? If you really want to go, we can arrange other ways for you to go. So... He arranged for Osha to take him down. So Osha's carrying him. Maester Pycelle is with them and they're down there. Pycelle says, you know, tell Osha the history of your family. So he's telling her about all the different crypts and who's in them. He gets to Lyanna and of course he tells her the story of Rhaegar um, kidnapping her and raping her and then her dying. They get to the crypt where Ned Stark is going to be buried and it's empty. And just as they're walking up to look... Uh, Shaggy Dog, Rickon's dire wolf comes and attacks them. Pycelle says that dog should be in the kennels because it's attacked people already. Because, you know, Rickon's a little boy. He can't exactly train him and it doesn't have a good follower right now. So, he he's a little wilder than the rest of them. And Rickon says, no, he doesn't like the kennels. They ask what the heck he's doing down there, and Rickon says, um, I saw a father down here. I came to look for father. And that's creepy as hell. Pycelle says, of course, it's weird that you both had the same dream, but if you think about it, it's not because you both miss your father. So, of course, you will be dreaming about him. But, I mean, dude, they both dreamt that he was down in the crypt of all places. Like, come on. That's weird. Osha says, uh, the children of the forest could tell you two a, a thing or two about dreams. And Pycelle's like, yep, the children are long and gone. Like, we, we're not going to talk about those things right now. So they leave the crypt. They go up to Pycelle's room or his quarters, whatever they're called. They're talking about magic. And Pycelle's, of course, like, oh, pish posh. That's, that's fake stuff. We aren't talking about that. Bran looks over and sees something in a, gla in a jar and... Pycelle says it's dragon glass. He takes it out and gives one to Bran, and Bran's like looking at it. Uh, they call it obsidian in Westeros, not dragon glass. Bran wants to keep one, and Pycelle lets him. So Pycelle tells him that they were here first, and that the first men came across the narrow sea, um, and no man had ever been uh, to what is now Westeros before. He says, no doubt the children were as frightened of the first men as they were of the faces in the trees. Like, 
because that is a little bit creepy. The, there were wars between the children and the first men, and finally they came to a pact, and they were the first men were given lands by the coasts and everything. Um, so that ushered in 4,000 years of peace between the first men and the children. They're talking about the first men and what happened after the pact uh, with the Andals and everything, and a raven comes to the window and has a message for Mesa Pycel, and he reads it, and Bran and Rickon immediately know what the message says. Like, he doesn't even have to read it out loud to know what was in the message. And Pycelle says that they're going to need a stone carver who knew what Ned looked like to make a statue of him. You gotta listen to kids when they're having dreams, dude. I mean, seriously. Okay, that's it for these three chapters. We'll do three more tomorrow. I hope you enjoyed. I will see you soon. We're getting to the end of the book. We're getting very close to the end. I will see you tomorrow. Have a good night.